What if, a generation from now, companies are unrecognizable? Now, a number of years ago, I did a project with a large association focused on the media industry at a time when it was just beginning to experience the early stages of disruption. At that time, I remember having a conversation with one very senior record exec who said that he wasn't worried about new tools like Napster opening up a Pandora's box of change because, quote, CD sales have never been higher. Well, in retrospect, we know how that turned out. When's, when's the last time you bought a CD, right? Now, it's very easy to look back on an executive who completely missed the way that something like digital music would turn his whole industry upside down and to kind of roll our eyes. But the thing is, people still get caught in familiar frameworks, and I would argue that the shifts facing us now are actually much bigger than those were, that were facing him then. Some of you may have already heard some of the predictions being made by tech industry gurus like Elon Musk, Eric Schmidt, and Bill Gates as they've tried to alert people to the implications of some of the technologies that their companies are developing now. Words like uh, roboticization of work and even jobs apocalypse are being thrown around. And they're not exactly comforting if you're thinking in terms of your own personal job security, right? The thing is, if these forecasts are even partially right, then we're going to need to rethink the frameworks we use to get things done on just about every level. And in a sense, that's been the focus of my career, uh, working along with partners to try to track new thinking about the ways that businesses could be structured and to prototype new systems by combining emerging technologies and emerging ideas to get things done in new ways. Basically, you can kind of think of it as trying to stress test the tools that we might use to build future businesses. Now, along those lines, some of the things that are becoming possible now are enough to give you goosebumps. Things are moving quickly, uh, and there are a number of factors in play, but I want to talk about two in particular, just as examples. One is platforms, and the other is machine learning. So platforms are digital matchmaking systems. They're all over the news right now as discussions about companies like Uber, Airbnb, and Lyft play out across the headlines. Uh, incidentally, for context, it's worth noting that Uber is now the third largest employer on Earth by total number of paychecks issued. Now, because these systems are good at matching people with resources, including human resources, they're already having an impact on, for example, hospitality, taxi services, even consulting. You know, areas where this kind of matching is critical. Uh, actually, there's a whole series of platforms growing up right now around the idea of connecting freelancers of all kinds to all kinds of work. Uh, a site called Upwork is the biggest of these and covers everything from accounting to graphic design. Now, expect to see more of this kind of work matching moving forward. Machine learning, on the other hand, is a particularly powerful kind of artificial intelligence and is the technology at the heart of, for example, uh, Siri, the iPhone personal assistant, or uh, Watson, the computer that you may remember winning Jeopardy a number of years ago. Now, some of the work we're doing suggests that while both machine learning and platforms are very powerful on their own, their power could really be unlocked when they're combined. To give you a sense of where this could be pushing companies, I want to describe one series of experiments that we've been doing to try to test the limits and see if it's possible for a machine to actually bring people together to get work done. We were particularly interested in automating the management of complex research processes. We wanted to create a push-button system, a kind of robo-manager, able to run workflows from end to end, ideally at a quality level the same as or higher than those using traditional approaches. Now, the system works with human assistants to restructure these workflows uh, like an evolving assembly line. From a human resource standpoint, it's the system that tries to find just the right person for each job using those freelancing platforms we mentioned and machine learning. So the robo-manager will actually go out and try to find talented people, hire them, give them a digital workspace, and then route them colleagues to either team up answer any questions, or review their work. In essence, what this had created is an evolving assembly line for knowledge work. So what does this mean 
for the project of rethinking companies and the ways that we get things done. Well, for me, the most exciting implication here is a very big one. For more than a generation, we've watched as a series of problems too big for today's organizational systems to handle has piled up one on top of another, slowly seizing up our economic, environmental, and political systems with a string of crises we can't fully fix. Think uh, climate change or the financial crisis. But what if we're now on the threshold of being able to build organizational power tools that are actually able to scale to meet these kinds of challenges? And it's not only for-profits that'll be reshaped in the wake of these. You can imagine, for example, somebody sitting down at a terminal and writing a computer program that's able to, say, fight hunger. It could do this by intelligently soliciting donations online and then using these to uh, acquire and then route resources to the places where an AI suggests they do the most good. Similarly, can you imagine what our disaster response, say responding to all of the fires we've been having, would look like if it was coordinated by the same kind of technology that Lyft uses to route cars? Very soon, I suspect we will be relying on software to find both emergency responders and the equipment they need and to orchestrate them to do the most good. One thing we need to understand here is how deep this disruption goes and what we need to do to adapt. Here, a couple of fundamental issues come to mind. First, we need to rethink, at an individual level, jobs. Jobs are not the only way to organize work, and already smart platforms are moving away from something that looks like jobs towards something that looks more like workflows. At an organizational level, we're going to need to rethink the concept of companies. Now, companies are not the only way to organize work, uh, and were originally developed mostly to coordinate industrial processes. Moving forward, it seems that we're on the threshold of organizations as a kind of technology, and a technology on the verge of disruption at that. Now, not too much further out, it's possible to imagine, for example, companies that behave like the more benevolent cousins of today's uh, ransomware computer viruses. Businesses in this world could be pieces of software designed to go out, bring together the resources necessary to make things and to get things done. So, for example, what if 20 years from now, not only most cars, but most companies are actually self-driving in some sense? What if, instead of facing a world of inevitable technological unemployment as robots take all of our jobs, we actually have the opportunity now to build systems that are able to identify and enhance the best talents that each of us have to offer. What if, a generation from now, the world's best leaders are, you know, kind of like the world's best chess and Go players today, not people at all, but pieces of software? In our lifetimes, organizational technologies are going to dramatically expand the realm of possibility. And for me, at least, that's the kind of thing that can give you goosebumps. Thank you.